Hey there, friends. Pastor Tyler here. So great to have you join us online here at Grace Covenant Church. And I want you, if you are watching this with someone, to turn to them and tell them you are worthy. And if you're watching it with yourself, I want you to say the words, I am worthy. And I ask you to do that because today we are looking at two parables in Luke 15. The parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost son, otherwise known as the par parable of the prodigal son. And in each of those parables, we see that Jesus is the good shepherd that goes after the lost. He cares about every individual human being. Every individual from these parables is worthy. Worthy of being searched after. Worthy of being found. Worthy of being redeemed. Worthy of being loved. You are worthy. You are worthy. And it took me in my own life a long time to figure this out because growing up, I knew that God was love and he was creator, redeemer, and sustainer, the triune God. And people would say all of these abstract things and I would say, okay, God is truth, God is love, God is graceful, God is forgiving. I get that, but what does that mean for me? What does that mean relationally? What does that mean about God's ability to empathize with what I'm going through? What does that mean about God's ability to have compassion on his people? And then someone reminded me that the person, Jesus, telling the parables that we are going to look at today is not unfamiliar with our pain. He is not unfamiliar with our suffering. Because it says in Isaiah 53, 3, about Jesus, about our Savior, about the author of these parables, it says that Jesus was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and he was held in low esteem. We have a Savior that is familiar with the sufferings of human beings. We have a Savior. If you feel like you are held in low esteem, if you feel like you've been rejected by society, if you feel like your co-workers or friends think less of you than they should, we have a Savior that recognizes that, that has felt that, and that can empathize with you. That was such a great eye-opener for me as a young Christian, that God isn't just a God that is up there in the heavens and saying that he loves us, saying that he has compassion on us, saying that he can empathize with us. He is a God that came to earth, suffered and died on the cross to save us from our sins. He knows our suffering. He knows our pain. And it is because of Jesus, it is because of the Good Shepherd that we can call ourselves worthy worthy of being searched after, worthy of being found, worthy of being redeemed, and worthy of being loved. Before we dig into scripture this morning, let me pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you that you are good and that you find us worthy of your love, of your compassion, of your mercy, of your forgiveness. We do not follow a God who is unfamiliar with our pain and suffering, but we follow a God and a Savior that entered into our pain and our suffering. And we know that regardless of our past actions, regardless of what other people think of us, regardless of what the world says about us, we are worthy of your love. And God, I pray as we dig into scripture this morning, you would help us to learn what you want us to learn and help us to grow in the ways that you want us to grow. And God, I pray that through your Holy Spirit, it would be your words that are spoken 
and not just my own. I pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, and everyone watching this together in unison said, Amen. So if you have your Bible, please turn with me to Luke chapter 15. I am going to start in verse 1. Jesus says, or the parable starts, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus, in response, told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Again, you, Jesus says in this parable, are worthy. You are worthy of being searched for, worthy of being found, worthy of being redeemed, worthy of being loved. But more than that, you are capable. Because in this, you are capable of being forgiven. You are capable of bringing God joy. And you are capable of making the heavens rejoice. Think about that. In knowing you are loved, in repenting and turning towards God, the heavens are rejoicing for you. For you. That is amazing. Think of that. The angels, God himself, the Son, Jesus Christ, as each individual, as you turn towards him, they rejoice in song and in dancing. It says there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Do you feel lost today? Do you feel rejected today? Do you feel lonely and isolated today? Oh, let me introduce you to a shepherd that wants to enter in to that isolation, wants to enter into that rejection, wants to enter into that loneliness. He wants to find you because you are worthy. You are loved. And often in life, we make excuses about why we aren't worthy, about why we can't be loved, by, about why we can't be saved. I've made those own excuses. If only God knew what I've done, he wouldn't love me. If God knew what other people thought of me or what other people said about me, he wouldn't love me. Or how about this one? If God knew what I've said about him in the past, how I've rejected him in the past, he wouldn't find me worthy. He wouldn't love me. And yet now we come to a parable, the parable of the lost son or the parable of the prodigal son. And this son did all of those things. He engaged in wild living with prostitutes. He rejected his father and squandered his inheritance. And yet, when he turned towards his father, his father celebrated. Our father, God in heaven, will celebrate 
you, regardless of what you've done in your past. And now I want to look at the parable of the lost son. And this is Luke 15, 11 through 32. So Jesus has done the parable of the lost sheep, and in between the parable of the lost sheep and the lost son is the parable of the lost coin, which makes a similar point. So now Jesus continues in verse 11. There was a man that had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And I want to stop right there because already in this parable, we see two things. And we have to remember that Jesus is telling this parable to the Pharisees, to the religious leaders of his time. And in this parable, the son who has gone away to a foreign country has already done two reprehensible things in the Pharisees' eyes. Number one, he has done wild living. And we learn later that he squandered his wealth, his inheritance by uh, hanging out with prostitutes and other things. So in the Pharisees' eyes, this son has rejected the moral law of the Torah, the moral law of the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. But furthermore, he's hanging out with pigs, and it is specifically forbidden in Leviticus 11, 7 through 8, to eat pork or to touch the carcass of a pig. So in him having to hang out with pigs and eat with pigs, that is another affront to the Pharisees. So for the Pharisees, this son, this man is reprehensible. He's disobeyed the moral law of the Torah and he's disobeyed the religious and ceremonial laws of the Torah. Leviticus 11, 7 through 8 actually says this, And the pig, though it has a divided hoof, does not chew the cud. It is unclean for you. You must not eat their meat or touch their carcasses. They are unclean for you. So the Pharisees have to be enraged by the son's action. And as we will see later, the brother his brother, the son's brother, is enraged by his actions. And yet, we have the heart of the father. So when the son came to his senses, continuing on in verse 17, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. He trusts, the son trusts, that even despite what he's done, if he repents and if he humbles himself, his father will welcome him and forgive him. Let's read on. But while he was a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. 
For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and, his, and has been found. They began to celebrate. The father's heart is the heart of Jesus, the heart of the shepherd. And then there's the brother's heart, the older son. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yes, you never gave me, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, come, comes home, you kill the fattened calf. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. As with the lost sheep, the father celebrates and welcomes home the lost son. There is a celebration in heaven waiting for you, waiting for me. We are worthy. We are the lost son. Even though sometimes we act like the older brother. We aren't the 99, and we aren't the brother. But does our moral and religious superiority get in the way? Are we like the Pharisees, who Jesus is telling this story to, in response to their accusation that he eats with sinners and tax collectors? We often forget that not one of us, not one, is without sin. We can try to act like the older brother, try to act like the religious elite, and look down upon those who have done bad things. We can look down upon those who have squandered an inheritance. We can look down upon those who have acted immorally. Or we can remember the words of Isaiah 53, 6. We all, and all means everyone, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him, that is Jesus, the iniquity, the sin of us all. Whenever I get in a self-righteous mode, mood, I have to remember that verse. I have to remember that I was lost, but I was found worthy of being searched after. I was found worthy of being found. I was found worthy of being redeemed. I was found worthy of being loved. And if I, in my lost state, in my sin, was found worthy, so also are you worthy. And I want to close specifically speaking to Christians right now. Who was gathering around to hear Jesus? Who did the Pharisees always accuse Jesus of hanging out with? Sinners and tax collectors. Hated for different reasons, but still hated. Thought to be unclean. 
are we attracting the same people that Jesus attracted? Are we attracting sinners? Are we attracting the lost? Are we attracting those that don't think they are worthy because the world has told them they aren't worthy? Are we as Christians giving people a new idea of what worth is? Are we showing them by our actions, by our deeds, by our words, that we want to find them so that they know that there's a God who wants to find them, redeem them, and love them. If we are not attracting the same people that Jesus attracted, if our life isn't full of sinners, if our life isn't full of us going out and seeking the lost, seeking the isolated, seeking the lonely, seeking those who have messed up and screwed up, who are we? Because we aren't followers of Jesus. If we're followers of Jesus, we will attract the same people that Jesus attracted. So let these two parables be a lesson for us. You are worthy and I am worthy. And let us come to the Father who loves us regardless of our past. And as Christians, let us go out and seek the lost. Have the same reckless abandon that our Savior does. To go find the isolated, find the marginalized, find those that have no hope and be bringers of hope, be bringers of life, be bringers of salvation through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. No one is truly lost because Jesus can and will find you. The question is, what will you do when he does? Let me pray, brothers and sisters. Father God, we thank you for this reminder that we are worthy. We are worthy. We are worthy. And God, let us always remember that. Nothing in our past separates us from your love. Nothing in our past separates us or creates a barrier between us and you. Nothing the world says about us takes away your love and your forgiveness. God, as we encounter you and your Son and the Holy Spirit day after day after day, help us to live into that love, that mercy, that grace, that forgiveness that is offered to us. All we have to do is accept us accepted. You have found us. What will we do knowing we have been found? God, I pray that through your Holy Spirit, we would have the strength and the courage to be lights in this world and be shepherds following after you, the good shepherd, who seek after the lost, the lonely, the heartbroken, the marginalized and bring them back into your fold. I pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Have a wonderful, wonderful week, everyone. God bless.